um, has, was uh, implemented by Dr. Erdl, as uh, uh, Hattie has mentioned. And uh, so we at uh, Sutter uh, got together with Hill and uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Robertson and with Roger Tao uh, initially and, and talked about the fact that we share so many physicians, uh, especially our primary care physicians who have uh, contracts both within uh, the Sutter system and Hill, and that the, a lot of the work that we're both doing uh, uh, is synergistic, and that we wanted to use this particular project as a way to kind of identify that collaboration that we had started with uh, Hill in a variety of other areas, uh, kind of recognize that there's uh, so much overlap that it's important uh, to work together for these conditions like uh, uh, improving hypertension care. And so it seemed uh, logical that uh, this uh, would uh, be something that uh, uh, both of us would move forward with very quickly. And uh, so I wanted, first of all, to thank uh, uh, Hill, thank Dr. Renner, thank Roger, and uh, Terry Hill uh, as well, uh, and, uh, and Doug Robertson for uh, the work that they did uh, in putting this together. Uh, one of the things we realized is that we didn't want to miscommunicate, uh, and so uh, uh, Hill uh, agreed that for our so-called tweeners, uh, we call them, who have uh, both contracts, that Hill would identify them as uh, you know, their primary contact and send the survey out, so I, I wouldn't have to send the survey as well. And that for the exclusive docs in SIP, that uh, SIP would... Uh, then send uh, the survey and communicate with them and then combine our results. So a lot of this work has been um, this combination. Uh, and our goal was to assess the adult hypertension treatment approaches and challenges faced by Hill and SIP and uh, primary providers. And uh, uh, so we sent out the survey together uh, uh, in August of uh, uh, 17 of, of 2015 to September 25th. We uh, combined had a total of 73 responses, or a 45% response rate. Um, Hill was able to get uh, 61 out of 130 or 47% of the primary care docs to respond. We had 32 of exclusive SIP docs, we got 12, so our numbers were a little lower, even though we tried uh, with several uh, uh, um, uh, requests, but 38%, but still, um, we feel that this is a, a reasonable assessment of the uh, what's happening in our network. Um, and so I want to turn it over to Dr. Renner, who's the vice chair for uh, uh, Hill, as well as the, I think you're, you're the chair for the Bay Region Medical Director. Uh, Bay Region, so thank you, Dr. Renner. with this particular aspect. And again, um, Dr. Arivola mentioned that uh, there are several people who are not here in this room who were part of this and uh, sort of stand on the shoulders of giants to be able to bring this stuff to you. We did, uh, I think part of the reason we may have gotten higher return on our surveys than the center is we tried one extra way to get that back and that was we have panel meetings quarterly with our primary care doctors and we actually put the survey in front of them in paper and asked them to fill it out, hung over their heads, and brought it back. So um, if, you're, if you're down to that sort of technique, it does seem to improve your numbers at least a little bit. So first thing we asked about um, was basically, do docs feel that they're comfortable? Uh, and I think you're all familiar with these questions because they were presented before by Dr. Erdl with the Mercy docs. And the, Big surprise question is the end is for the most part, we answered pretty much the same as they did. Um, but starting off, uh, knowledge, do the docs feel like they're comfortable knowing what to do for hypertensive patients? Yes. And the majority felt their medical assistants were doing well. Now, some of us are a little optimistic, I think, in private practice about what our medical assistants are doing because we never see it. Um, but, but they do express a pretty high level of confidence. And then this is the awareness of treatment goals. And you can see that the vast majority of our physicians really are picking the right treatment goals for the right age groups. Um, obviously, there's some variation here. There's some variation in national guidelines. 
but nothing to really you know, pick on or hang your hat on as a particular problem. Lifestyle change recommendations, these are remarkably similar to what the um, Mercy doctors are recommending. Uh, I think appropriate, all of us will look at those and say yes. So no big surprise there. I'm glad that our docs feel that they're recommending them to their patients. But the next question is, what proportion of patients do they feel could actually be controlled on lifestyle changes alone? And very small number. So most of our docs, over 60%, think that less than 25% of their hypertensives could be controlled on lifestyle changes alone. So that takes us into the area of medications. So first line medications for African Americans and non-African Americans. You can see that ACE inhibitors were the big winner for the non-African Americans. This again is consistent with the Mercy docs and with many guidelines. Calcium channel blockers and um, beta blockers come in as, as good seconds as well as the thiazide diuretics. Can you spend some time on yes. this slide? Um. I, don't, I only have 11 minutes, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a particular question you'd like to know? Uh, well, when Dr. Erdl presented on the African American, non African American uh, uh, results, mm -hmm. um, uh, it was a little bit surprising the knowledge gap on the fact that the treatment needs to be somewhat different. And it's hard for us to just look at that slide and understand what is the meaning of your results. Uh, so I think that you guys' knowledge is better, actually, than what our results are. Yeah, they, I get, they, I get, they have more awareness that calcium channel blockers are really an appropriate first line for right. African Americans. Yeah, if we, go, if we go with here, you can see a huge difference in ACE inhibitors recommended as first line treatment. Uh, less than 20% for docs treating African American patients under the age of 60, and greater than 80% um, for non African Americans. And then for the African Americans, the primary choice are the calcium channel blockers and the thiazides, which are appropriate first choices. So I look at this and say I think our docs have an understanding that different populations need different. Oh, 100%, but then need different treatment interventions. You're seeing something else? I think that our gap in knowledge was worse for the Mercy Downs. So I don't think that our calcium channel blockers for African Americans was the same. Yes, your calcium channel blockers for African Americans was, was pretty low. Your thiazide was clearly the first choice. So that shows that 55% of your doctors understand that you need to use the calcium channel blocker with African American hypertension patients but that 45% don't? Is that what that says? No. no. So this is, the, this, the question as I understand it was asked is what are your first line agents? You can pick more than one. So in, in answer for African Americans, our docs said if I were to choose a African American person under 60 and pick a medication, um, I would either pick an angiotensin uh, receptor blocker, an ARC, I'm sorry, green, I would check a calcium channel blocker, or I would check a thiazide diuretic. So 50 or 60 percent of the time, that would be one of my first choices. But it's not a one choice only question. So that, I think that, does that make that a little more clear? Well, it's good news. <laughs> it's good news. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. No, and, and I appreciate it. I don't know exactly what level of uh, depth you went into um, the previous study, and then I know that survey was presented a year ago. More so, more, so. More than that. Okay, so you so you might not have quite as fresh in your mind as I do. And plus, yes. the uh, the hypertension pocket cards have been distributed. Um, exactly. And so they would have reason to um, have the current knowledge in hand. Yes. We uh, well, yes and no. When we get to another question, less than twenty percent of the docs say that they. Uh, a large percentage of docs say that they consult guidelines less than twenty percent. But it is, these are sort of double slides where you're getting a percentage of docs saying about a percentage of their patients. So anybody who has any other questions about clarification, do, do bring that up. I did have the um, opportunity to have several of my staff go over th with these multiple times so that I could get actually the statements correct. So second line treatments, we actually com combined two questions here, second and third line treatments. Um, so this also 
pretty much mirrors what the Mercy Docs said. Again, we were a little bit um, stronger in using uh, calcium channel blockers, oops, calcium channel blockers than um, the Mercy Docs were. And, um, but these are the third line agents in purple and then the second line agents in teal. So again, somebody might want to have some comments about appropriateness of second and third line agents. My feeling is uh, we're getting into, once starting with the ACE inhibitors and then adding a diuretic, we're starting to get into pretty customized individualized therapy, what patients tolerate and what don't. Um, hopefully not which drug rep has most recently come by. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we had in our guideline, um, in particular, was to encourage combination therapies. So of the combination therapies that they chose, so this is kind of a tricky question, but of the combination therapies that you chose, 90% of our doctors are going with ACE thiazides, which is actually what we have in, in the Hill algorithm as the, as the first choice. So that's good. What this doesn't say is how many times do you make that your first choice. So that's an unfortunate. <laughs> you know, it's always easy to be that armchair or quarterback. I would have written it differently. I, I, I worked the circuit in about an hour or something. <laughs> I remember me presenting that in Oakland and, and saying that. I was um, astonished that it did so well. Um, so this is a question of what can percentage of your patients are taking combination therapy. We think combination therapy works. We think um, we should be encouraging combination therapy. Now, what I did with this number was I went back to my staff and asked them, so this is great, this is what the docs think they're doing, what are they actually doing? Turns out that in uh, 2014, only 12% of our patients were provided a combined prescription for an ACE and something else, and in 2015, 16% were. Now, maybe that improvement is based on our um, guidelines getting out. One of the problems, and, and, and not to pick on the design of the study, but when <laughs> physicians, there's two sort of questions here, therapy versus therapeutic agent. So our docs seem to think that they're writing the proper combined therapy a lot of the time. Our data says they're not doing the combined agents. So to me, that's an opportunity for improvement to maybe reduce pill burden, for patients, um, reduce prescription payments, that sort of thing. So they think they're doing what we want them to do, and our data shows they're not quite doing it in, in the sample, study sample that we have. Did you have a, any comment on that? No, it's, a, it's fascinating. So this is a convoluted slide, a little bit. Um, these are my very high-tech people who put this together for us. And I'm just going to bring it down to the bottom line. And this is, um, you should read this as, for patients over six, under 60 years of age, over 50% of our doctors thought that 75% or more of their patients were in control. So what we're asking is for the docs to assess how good are they at keeping their patients in control or how successful are they. And, and the docs thought that 75% of the docs, I mean, sorry, 50% of the docs thought that 75% or more or their patients were in control. I'm not going to go to the other ages, but you can see in general, we, the green line on the far right, the docs thought they were doing pretty well. Um, our data is actually not quite that good. Um, in Sacramento, for Hill docs, now this is, doesn't include the this, this docs, but just for going back to kind of facts check, um, sex suggests that about 32% of our practices have over 75% control. So there's 20% of those folks in there were a little delusional. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then 49% of our practices did have um, 50 to 75% control. So the people who think they're in the 50 to 75% um, area are probably about right. The nice thing about what shows on this slide is that doctors do rec recognize that there isn't 100% control within their practice, which is a barrier we have had in other measures to sort of beat doctors down on some way to say it, um, get inside their head that no, they're not 100% good at this. Um, and these kinds of surveys can, can help show this sort of thing, and then when we bring back the data. So there, there are docs out there who would like to control more of their patients, get more of their patients under control. 
So that, I think, is a good thing, because we'd like to have that happen, too. Any questions on that slide? Yeah, I think that's a really oh. important comment, that, yeah. there, that, that doctors do recognize that, that they don't have a lot, of, some of their patients are control, but, yeah. but it is a great opportunity for us to kind of work with them and find out how do we, how do, can we help you with controlling that population. Right. I get to go past that slide. So, this, this slide talks about what um, doctors felt were the barriers to their patients. And we put stars next to a couple of them, but you can see down at the bottom, it's pretty heavy on um, patient activity. Patients willing to make, come in for visits, patients willing to make changes in their lifestyle, uh, medication adherence due to financial reasons, and in general, medication adherence way up there in the, in the 90%. So the vast majority of our docs think that, that patient, in, if we put it in another framework or vocabulary, the vast majority of our docs think that patient engagement is a problem. When we go up to this star up here, it also shows that they really don't have any faith in patient engagement, which has been shown to be very valuable in the literature. So um, they're saying our, our patients aren't in control. They're saying they aren't in control because our patients aren't engaged. But they're also kind of saying, and we don't really think we know how to do it. We don't think a team-based approach will work. And I pretty much think everybody in the room knows that there's quite a bit of literature uh, suggesting that there really is a value to team-based approach. And this was another great slide in terms of looking for opportunity. Um, that's how I would best phrase this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, national campaigns, measure up, pressure down, Million Hearts campaign. Campaigns that are working to work with the public, provide patient engagement toolkits, wonderful sets of things just on their websites if you control it for, for 15, 20 minutes. Um, the docs don't even know it exists. So that's a huge opportunity for us because if, if our docs are saying, yeah, our patients are controlled, yeah, it's a patient engagement problem, but I don't know what to do about it, here's the answers, or at least some of the answers. This is kind of an aside in terms of blood pressure, home blood pressure monitoring. From my reading of the literature, it's kind of questionable whether home blood pressure monitoring and patient engagement really do go well together. Our docs basically said they thought about half of the docs who were recommended to get a blood pressure machine got it, and about half of them used it. Um, so about 25% use it. Right. <laughs> of all your patients. Right. What's interesting is in Spain, on CPAP machines, they can tell how often you're using, how often you're using them now because of the, the electronic success. And if you're not using it 60% of the time, they take it back. <laughs> it's a nationalized health system. Interesting solution. So here we go, specifically the question of team-based approach care. Now this is different from Mercy Docs, which if I remember correctly, we're about 50-50 or 49-51% saying the team-based approach might work or might not. Um, I think that the, there are a couple reasons that our population might be a little different in this. One is that um, they haven't had good exposure to team-based care, or that the team-based care approach that they've been exposed to is poor. Uh, some of our docs, we have a, um, an older population, have lived through the uh, care management companies that came through Medicare a decade or more ago, who basically said doctors don't need to be involved, we can manage the care. Oddly enough, it didn't work that well. Um, so I think there may be uh, a different way to phrase this that you would get a more positive answer. But it's interesting to know that we have a, a bit of a, a publicity problem here in what our docs think of team-based care. Maybe it's also because they're, they're affiliated by an IPA, they're solo and small group practices, and they can't logistically handle team-based care. Right, so, so one of the, um, the comments about, particularly with respect to clinical clinics, is docs don't want, they're, they're using every time they touch a patient as an opportunity to do multiple things, or max practicing our visions. So if you now say, I'm gonna send somebody over here for their hypertension, we've lost that opportunity to say, did you get your mammogram? Um, so I have heard that voice. And yes, in terms of a, a, a practice of uh, two or three doctors, which uh, for Hill, about 60% of our patients identify their primary care as a less, three or less doctor practice, it, they, they can't establish their own team-based care. So someone has to come in and help them with it, which I think is what 
we're supposed to exist for. Any, any other thoughts or comments on that? So my thoughts for here on the, on the take home points are our docs pretty much know how to treat hypertension and pretty much know what the goals are. But that's probably not where our low hanging fruit is. Um, it sounds from this survey that our low hanging fruit would be in increasing patient engagement and adherence. And uh, UC Davis, Sharp, Gunderson Health, and Palo Alto have all um, presented to, I believe, this forum um, patient engagement uh, programs that have actually improved blood pressure control. So we have the perception of the docs that that's what needs to happen, and we have some um, obvious successes that have shown that. Um, and just figuring out how for the challenge for our organization, and I think for Sutter Independent Physicians too, is getting to those docs and getting them to realize what resources are available and how to hook them up uh, together. Um, we know community pharmacists help. We know that, I mean, I personally, we have a virtual care pharmacy within Hill Physicians that we're piloting. I've used it for a couple of my patients and found it to be hugely successful. Um, that's obviously anecdotal. So any uh, thoughts or questions? I have a, just a couple of appendix slides, which I don't think I'll present to you, which show that we did actually ask the other questions. What kind of gaps in education do you feel like you have? And then um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, less than 20%, let's see. Over 50% of our docs said that less than 20% of the time did they ever consult a guideline in care of their patients. So they're, they're not looking at it that much. Yes? So, so one thing that seems to be different in the IP setting versus uh, a foundation setting is the ability to use the electronic medical records as ubiquitous across a key-based approach. And when you embed certain things like guidelines, which can be uh, perhaps a little easier to embed in, in one system versus multiple systems that we have, like you know, 40 or 50 different systems. So that may be one of the reasons why team approach, there's not as, as much of a, at least a, 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 a willingness of a, our primary care doctors to see that there might be an opportunity there, is because you know we do have that challenge. So, so again, it, it sort of speaks to the fact that uh, at some point we, may need to fi try to figure out whether there's an opportunity uh, for, for independent practice to identify ways to, to ch exchange uh, electronically these sorts of things in a much more efficient and fluid way if you get in the way of the doc uh, by having 10 extra clicks. So, so um, I think that's, again, one of the challenges that we have to think about. And I think you did have a previous presentation here where one of your speakers pointed out that if you give docs an idea of what you want them to do, they're really, really likely to do it. Um, don't just tell them their goal and send them out to figure out a way to do it. Um, and, and yes, knowing that, that that connection is there. One of the things that we have found successful is creating patient lists from our data saying, and we intentionally did this, these are your patients not in control by our data, these are your patients who are at high risk because of other reasons, diabetic. And then this is the whole list of your patients who are in control. So we weren't <coughs> handing them a patient, piece of paper that just said, mm, better take a look at this. It was showing them their success as well as their opportunity. And, and that was pretty well received and I have had docs ask for an updated version of that and we are trying to make that continuously electronically available. Yes? Are you participating in the physician transformation network? In implementing team-based care, mm -hmm. that's, that's one approach. Yes. Are you? Not me personally. I mean, is Sutter? No, 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 not our IPA. No. Not Sutter IPA? No, Christina. I'm sorry. Yeah. The IHA program that you were No, the uh, CQC. Uh, uh, the PTI? Yeah. PBGH. Yeah, PBGH. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah. Yes. Rusty, we are. Yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> you, you signed up. Yes. <laughs> and, and that was, uh, Christina, you know, I know you all were very ill, and this was Christina Gilkey, who's um, helping exceptionally taking over Roger's role in this, and, and I expect that she and I will be working together a lot with and, and Ron Chambers, behind me, who delivered our hypertension talk. Yeah, so I've never actually seen you. <laughs> And, and then Andy Chow, who's our project manager over the back, so we, have, we, have, we do have a team here. 
Yes. Well, we, we hope that you found doing the survey useful for your own training needs, you know, possibly helping you to think of CME that you want to offer to your docs, uh, maybe on the measure of pressure down, et cetera, and that you might even consider doing the uh, second part of the survey, which is for your MAs. I think, uh, Dr. Erdahl, um, maybe you just want to say a couple words about the big aha light bulbs that went off when you saw your MA results to entice. Yeah, um, it, it, the MA survey is just as lousy as the physician survey. Uh, also constructed, uh, and Mary is to blame for that largely. She <laughs> said, you know, uh, we're going to do a survey of MAs, but what we found is that there are large gaps in knowledge on proper, uh, properly taking a blood pressure. And so you, in those questions in that survey were lar largely based off of plank points on measure pressure down. And we just provided training and then figured out that 14% of the time we don't take blood pressures on visits. Lots of specialties weren't doing it, like dermatology, and we said that's going to end. And so um, I think that getting, uh, we had a web-based training and then in-person training uh, to take, uh, on how to take a proper blood pressure and, uh, and then getting everybody to do it all the time. Those are big changes for us. So very helpful. I don't, I don't even think you need to survey the MAs. I think that just having them, and there are several that are available online right now. I just have people do it. Yeah, I, I've seen a fabulous video that I would just like to make every MA on our uh, system sit down and watch. Um, that we don't get the MAs together because we're an IPA. If we're lucky, we get the office managers together. We actually, I think, did run a similar survey by them, and their results, of course, everything they do is perfect. <laughs> so that, I, it wasn't very helpful, but yes, getting into the MAs, I think, is important. Um, but I think, I mean, for me, the mes message was really we need, we have ways to support our physicians for patient engagement, and we should be using them. We should be get, getting our physicians to understand those things. So, big up. Yeah. So, one of the things that we also decided was that uh, we're going to re replace the, our normal blood pressure, manual blood pressure cuts with all mm -hmm. because they're just a lot less variable as far as um, what you get. Yeah. Uh, part of the proper improper technique is blowing the blood pressure cut too fast and all of those things. Very terrible stethoscopes. I MAs mean, have reversed stethoscopes. Um, so anyway, just, those are important things too. So, so you decided on blood pressure every visit, every specialty, right? And then uh, put into the EMR uh, some guidance as to if it's over a certain level then they have to take certain steps. It was, wasn't an EMR, it's just part of the training for the MAs. Because again, part of the pushback from the specialist was, well, we don't know what to do about it when we get one. Well, you don't have to do anything about it. <laughs> Send that back to the primary care. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 looking at our data recently, I, I would think that for us, ophthalmology is a huge opportunity. Because in terms of individual patient visits, um, we have a lot of people who see the ophthalmologist <laughs> A disturbingly high number. Orthopedic surgery. Yeah. yeah. So, and often the orthos don't take it. Okay, I think, um, unless there are any other questions from the audience. Yes? I just have a comment to make. Mm -hmm. um, hi, this is Thomas Calvary, Crack Camp Working. One of the things I've worried about from a patient perspective is when you're making diagnosis of hypertension. That that diagnosis is the appropriate diagnosis. There's not an underlying cause to that diagnosis. For instance, I have a, a family member that I just found out. She's very young. They put her on hypertension meds. She's never had a problem with hypertension. And now she's having kidney failure. She never even knew why they put her on, on hypertension meds. And the conversation I've had with her is like, I don't know why I'm taking it. That conversation is critical between the physician and the patient so they know why they're taking it and what are the signs and symptoms that they may be having rather than just say, I'm putting on hypertension medicine because we need to get your blood pressure down. Because we're looking at population health rather than personal centric health. I, I would agree with you um, that that conversation needs to happen. And as a practicing physician, I would tell you that it needs to happen a second or a third time. Because the time that you see somebody and say your blood pressure is high, I'm putting you on this medicine, it's because I want to protect you from heart attack and stroke and kidney failure. They're, they've heard, oh my god, I have to take blood pressure medicines. And they need, they need that follow-up opportunity. And, and you're actually right, and, and labs should be drawn. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, I, there's definitely opportunity to improve physician-patient communication as well as, um, and that's why the specialists are so afraid of it. They don't want to take the blood pressure because they don't want to have to deal with the tying. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Um, and and I, but the question I thought you were going to ask is, once you get a diagnosis of hypertension in an electronic medical chart, it's almost impossible to get out. Um, there is a diagnosis of elevated blood pressure, which just says it's elevated that day. Um, and if we we're going to go down in the minutia of coding, that's, that's what we should see happening for people. That wasn't the question you asked. I think we have more. That was, that was Thank you. fantastic. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Mary Ferguson from um, Health Services Advisory Group. So I have the pleasure of introducing the next speaker, uh, Dr. Jim Schultz. Uh, Jim is the Chief Medical Officer of the Neighborhood Healthcare Center since 2001, and uh, it's the uh, it's a healthcare center that serves about 65,000 patients in uh, in San Diego. It has 11 sites, and uh, Jim Charles is a family physician who splits time between active patient care and administrative duties as the chief medical officer, and also um, is a part-time hospitalist at, a, uh, at the Palomar Medical Center. Now, uh, he had led the electronic um, health record implementation in his, uh, in his center, and, and also led the changes to uh, NCQI accreditation for primary care, prim uh, patient-centered medical home, level three accredi accreditation. And he's also a volunteer clinical professor at UCSD, Department of Family Medicine. And last but not least, he got awarded the diploma in mountain medicine and is pursuing a fellowship in the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's give him a big Dr. Schultz has been a member of our first University of Best Practices since the early days of 2001, and he has many, many lessons to share with us in Sacramento. Thank you for making the trip, Jim. So the diploma in mountain medicine things, because we have so many avalanches in San Diego. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, as you heard, I'm, I'm a family physician. I'm not a rubber chicken speaker <coughs> guy, so we're just talking to a family doc. Um, and I was asked to talk about uh, HIPS, hiding in plain sight, which is um, identifying undiagnosed hypertension. Uh, after hearing the data group and, and Dr. Renner talking, I'm a little reluctant to talk about that because my reaction would be, I can't even take care of the people that I have, let alone find out new ones. But anyway, so the story of the hiding in plain sight really is the story of quality improvement in a community health center. So it, it's just, it kind of happened by accident. Uh, and so I'll go through, I think there's some lessons learned in how we dealt with hypertension and how we dealt with uh, hiding in plain sight, the undiagnosed hypertension that are kind of lurking in our offices but not really being recognized. So it's a mountain to climb, for sure. Um, so this started, this hiding in plain sight uh, started, we've been participating in a um, joint effort between, as part of the Million Hearts campaign with the Centers for Disease Control and the National Association of Community Health Centers. Uh, we started in on this, this particular project in January of 2015. Um, and this was a result of an article or um, a review, what they, a viewpoint that was published in JAMA in October of 2014, uh, or November 2014, by Hillary Wall and some others, they kind of described that we're missing a lot of our, there's a lot more hypertensive out there than we're really even recognizing. And they did a nice uh, job in this viewpoint of kind of going back and analyzing how, what the, what the problem was, what the scope of the problem was, and what some, some potential solutions were. So here's what they found, and some of these are numbers that you guys probably know already, uh, but it's about a third, almost a third of the adult population in the U.S. has hypertension. 
uh, especially in that 40 to 59 age group, and over 60, 60 plus is higher prevalence, uh, blacks have a much higher rate. And it turns out, and I didn't know this, but nationally about 40%, a third to 40% of hypertension patients are undiagnosed. And if you take the total uh, population of hypertensive patients in the U.S. is about 70 million, that's, uh, that one-third number is pretty, that's a lot of patients. Um, and, and you know this too, that if people who have lower blood pressure live longer, they live five years longer if they don't have hypertension. You know, if we lower our blood pressure five millimeters of mercury, it reduces our heart attack and stroke and congestive heart failure risk, kidney disease, and all sorts of things. So it behooves us to find these folks and treat them. So they, uh, this is how this is, <coughs> uncontrolled hypertension group breaks out. So there's about 34 million uncontrolled hypertensives in the U.S. 17 million are, they know they have hypertension and they're on medication. They're just not adequately treated. Uh, there's, we have some patients who <coughs> have hypertension and you can't shove a pill down their throat. Uh, they just won't take it. And then we've got 13 million that are unaware. So the, the HIPS article, uh, the Hiding in Plain Sight article, kind of looked at, well, maybe these people just aren't getting, maybe they're not, they're unidentified because they don't have insurance. Well, 82% of them have insurance. Maybe they don't have a primary care physician. 82% of them have a usual source of care. Maybe, maybe they have a source of care and they have insurance, they, don't, they just don't go to the doctor. There's some, but 62% go to the doctor. So, that's 62%, that's on us. That's not on the patient necessarily. So there, when you read the, through the article, what they recommended was a few, they made some, a uh, few basic recommendations. One was look at your practice data, try to figure out what your, do you have some of these folks in your practice? Then if you do, which probably everybody does, um, you develop some sort of systematic approach to identifying them, getting them in office, and doing some intervention to get them to goal. Um, and that one of the tools that they uh, they offered was, you know, look at what you're based 